Thank you very much. Just waiting for a second to get the presentation <coughs> on screen. Thank you very much. Let me extend uh, my thanks to the organizers for this fantastic um, conference, for the uh, splendid organization. It's, it's an honor and pleasure for me to be here. My topic today um, seems a bit peculiar, but I, I hope to show you things that you might not have heard before. My topic is predictive analytics in sports arbitration. So what is predictive analytics about? Predictive analytics, first and foremost, has to do with prediction. Okay, prediction. Now, this is not a new phenomenon. This is a phenomenon that we've had during all past uh, periods. It is, it is the wish of people to know what the outcome of their litigation is. Now, normally, if, if you as a lawyer are being asked, what are my chances to win this case? I mean, what we normally do is we try to evade this question at any costs. Yeah? So we, we hide behind some proverbs we will tell you in court and on high seas, one's fate is in God's hand, I can't give you a response. Or we would say, for example, Udex non calculat, which is, of course, a complete lie, because when it comes to fees, we love calculating. Yeah? So at the end of the day, why, why are we so reluctant to give an answer yeah, to these questions? What, what is the prediction of the outcome of my case? And at, at the end of the day, it's because it is a super complex question to apply the facts and to apply the law. Now, there are various ways how you can tackle this problem. What, what most lawyers would do is they would give you an answer by, I call this, intuition. It's a gray-haired person with a beard, lots of experience, little belly. He will look into his glass of whiskey and tell you, I know what the prediction is going to be. The problem with intuitive predictions is that, that it's mostly inherently wrong. Why is it inherently wrong? Because we dislike complexities. So if there are lots of variables, what we tend to do actually is we pick out one variable and, and give it a weight which it shouldn't have. And by doing so, of course, we, we run into mistakes. Or what we do as well is confirmation bias. Um, this is best expressed by this expression that you find here, which says, you never have a second chance to make a good first impression. And this is absolutely true. Once you've made up your mind, you, you read all information very selectively. You will weight especially those kinds of information that, that back your first finding, and you would discard all the other information which means that if you're wrong the first time, it gets wronger and wronger and wronger over the period of time. Another, I would say, example why intuition is probably a, a bad way of doing prediction is because we tend desperately to search for consistency and regularity. What do I mean by this? So for example, the other day I showed my students a sequence of numbers, okay? And this number, I don't know whether you can read it, it's one, two, three, five, and eight. And then you have dots and you ask your students, what are going to be the next numbers? And it takes them a while and then they would say, well, it's obvious the next number must be 13. And the next number is 21. So what they're looking for is consistency. It's the uh, Fibonacci um, uh, sequence so that you add the first two numbers and these are going to be the next number. I mean, it's, it is rather peculiar that out of five numbers that I give people, they try to find a sequence. It could be a sheer coincidence, it could be anything. Yeah? So once again, this is a bad thing about intuition. We look for some regularities and we come up with wrong, with wrong results. And then there's reactive, what I call discounting. So what we tend to do, we, we tend to evaluate information depending on the source. Now, if it's our opponent in a litigation, of course, the information will be wrong from the outset. Yeah, we will say, ah, oh, that's typical. Uh, of course, yeah. This is what he says. He has to say this because he's gonna lose the case. So we, we don't even listen to the information which is vital for our case, but we tend to discard it. And at the end of the day, I think the biggest problem that we have with intuition is that we're just not built to assess complex risks. 
Here again, I will give you a couple of examples that I gave to my students and, and try to answer those questions intuitively. Yeah? So the first example, for example, is you drive to a concert, your average speed on your way out is 120 Ks. On your way back, you run into some bottlenecks and your average speed is 60 Ks. Now, if I would ask you intuitively, what is the average speed? Who would say among you it's 80 kilometers per hour? Who would say it's 85 kilometers per hour? Who would say it's 90 kilometers per hour? Yeah, at least we have some people that dare to, to raise their hand. And the funny thing is it's 80 kilometers, it's not 90. And there are plenty of examples like this. Another one that I gave to my students is, you want to make a present to your daughter or your kid. Um, it's a table tennis racket or bat, and you need also a ball. Together they will cost one 10, and the bat costs one unit more than the ball. What is the price of the ball? Now I bet that intuitively most of you will say 10. Yeah, it's rather obvious. One 10, you deduct one dollar and it's going to be 10. The correct answer again would be five. Yeah? So again, intuitively, we are pretty bad at assessing risks. And there are plenty of other examples. This one I like uh, as well. You have a paper napkin, and the paper napkin is only one millimeter thick. You fold it once, you fold it twice, you fold it 50 times. And the question is, how high is the stack of paper in front of you? 10 meters? 100 meters? 100 million kilometers? It's 100 million kilometers. I bet a lot of you would not have guessed that this is over 100 million kilometers. And the final thing is, to make it evident, is you have 22 football players on the pitch, and you have one umpire. And what are the chances that two out of these 23 people are born on the same day of the year? Not the same calendar year, of course, but on the same day of the year. Rather surprising, the um, chances are about 50%. Yeah? Mostly when people guess, they would never come up with such kind of solution. So at the end of the day, what I'm not trying to tell you is that you're bad mathematicians. What I'm trying to tell you is that intuitively, we're just not built yeah, to, to have a good assessment of risk, yeah? because we have difficulties with numbers. Now, what could be another solution if intuitively we're so bad in assessing risks? What else could be done? Now, what a lot of lawyers then do is they try to simulate. They try to simulate the decision of the arbitrator. Yeah? So how does this work, simulating the decision of the arbitrator? What we tend to do is, and I gave you an example here, you have a coach that executed a no-cut contract with a Chinese club. The letter terminates the contract, residue value of the contract amounts to 100,000 Swiss francs. The parties are in dispute and there are mainly three topics that the parties discuss. The first one is, is there just cause to terminate the contract? The second one is, would the um, coach have easily found alternative employment in the amount of 50,000? And then there is an issue with the deadline of appeal, whether or not the deadline was missed or not. Now the question is how do you approach this? One way of approaching this in order to assess the risk is in, you try to simulate the decision of the arbitrator. What will the arbitrator do? The arbitrator will have three topics that he will have to look at. It's going to be the deadline, it's going to be whether there's just cause or not, and the third thing would be whether there was alternative employment available. Now, the second thing what you would do in order to assess the risk is probably you map the decision knots, just the same way as an arbitrator would try to decide the case. And then it would look pretty much like this. The first question would be deadline missed, yes or no. The second question would be just cause, yes or no. Third one would be alternative employment, yes or no. Next step what you would do is you would then allocate the risk of these various alternatives. Let's assume the risk of deadline missed is 50%. Let's assume that just cause, that there is just cause is about 
and alternative employment would be 70%. Now, the question really is, are we capable of, of giving it a percentage? Are, are we able really to, to assess this risk precisely with those figures? And a lot of people would say, this is very difficult and probably not feasible. But at the end of the day, I think it is possible. It is possible because what you try to do is you always take the person with the best evaluation competence to evaluate the risk. Secondly, you will tell them, look, it's not decisive how you want to decide the case. What is decisive, how the arbitrator will decide the case. So put yourselves always in the shoes of the arbitrator. The third thing what we do is we would tell the analyst, make your reasoning transparent. Show us your reasoning why you opt rather for this than for that if you allocate the percentage. And then finally make your estimation. Yeah? And then at the end of the day, when we have the estimation, we can assess the total expectation value. And the total expectation value of a claim of 100,000 would be around 30,000. Okay, so this would be simulating the decision of the arbitrator. Now, there are of course some advantages and disadvantages attached to this method. What are the advantages and disadvantages? The advantage is for sure, it's a very structured approach to legal problems, okay? In addition to that, it increases risk awareness because we know exactly where the points of concern are. In addition to that, it might increase our efficiency in working on the topic because we would know then where we would have allocate our time in order to, to increase our overall estimation. And finally, it's of course also a sound business investment because depending on where the problems are, you would know whether you need, for example, an expert opinion in a certain field or not. Now, there are of course also disadvantages attached to this method and the disadvantages are that a lot of people will say this is spurious accuracy because it all depends on the probability figure and this is so difficult to assess. True enough, it's excessive and costly because you have for every single step you need an expert to allocate those risks and to assess those risks. In addition to that, it is of course a liability trap for the council, because once you put that down on paper and you lose the case and the client gets hold of this, I don't want to be in your shoes. And finally, it's a juridification of the problem, because what, what this model is based upon is that we have an homos juridicus, somebody who only decides based on judicial premises. At the end of the day, this is not true, yeah? Because there are a lot of elements a judge will take into account when taking his decision um, that have nothing to do with legal requirements. Of course, the arbitrator will base on logic, he bases his decision on a methodology, he will base it on his experience, but there are a lot of other elements that play an important role in an arbitration. What are those? psychological, political, social stamp. I mean, everybody knows there might be arbitrators that are rather pro-club, pro-athlete, pro-federation. Yeah? This is how you've been socialized, which of course has an impact on your decision. What else do we find? We can never avoid it also the judge takes his decisions based on intuition, and we've seen that intuition is so bad yeah, when it comes to accuracy of the prediction. In addition to that, there's something like an anchor effect, and, and this plays an enormous role from my perspective in appeals arbitration proceedings where, where the International Federation will always put forward a number, and everything circles around this number. And the one who puts down the number first has always an advantage. Again, I will give you an example that I tested on my student, and the example I did with my student was as follows. I, I told them there is a nationwide newspaper called NZZ, and this is the offer. You have the offer online prescription for 59. You have a print edition that you can acquire for 110, and you can have an online and print um, subscription for 110. Now, the interesting thing was that I would say about 60% took the online print edition, and probably 40% only took the online edition. Then I rephrased it with another group, and by rephrasing it, I did it like this. I said, well, what about if the choice is between an online edition of 59 and an online print edition of 110? 
And I would say 90% of my students opted for the online edition only. What do I want to demonstrate to you is, I mean, who puts down a certain number, people will circulate around this number. And this, of course, plays an enormous role in, in those litigations. Um, plenty of other examples that I could give you. So what I want to tell you at the end of the day, this, this is a good method, yeah? The method of simulating the decision of an arbitrator, but of course there are a lot of factors that would not enter into such a system. Now, what else is there? Well, we have predictive analytics. Now, what is predictive analytics? Predictive analytics is a part of legal tech. It is, it is an area where the legal meets technology, data, okay? Now, if we talk about legal tech, most people will say, well, he's just told us how complicated it is to deliver a decision. How on earth will a computer or an algorithm ever be able to substitute the judge? This is impossible. We've seen that, how complex it is. We have, on the one hand, a procedure. The judge will have to collect the facts or People would have to present the facts, we would have to apply the law, then we have the personality, the super complex personality of the arbitrator, of the parties, yeah? And then at the end of the day, we have also these extraneous considerations that have nothing to do with the law. How on earth will an algorithm be able to accomplish such a complex task? And the interesting thing is, that's what we talked or uh, thought in the 50s. If you look at movies in the 50s, the, the idea was that even if the um, task is super complex, if we subdivide it in many, 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 many tasks, the computer or the algorithm will be able to substitute the decision of a human. And when you look at these movies, typically those computers look like humans. Yeah? This is the idea of the past. Now today we're much more modest. Today we know exactly that we can never substitute a human. We cannot decide in lieu of a human where we need legal tech today, I would say, are sub-areas, and most of you will be familiar with the sub-areas. One of the areas would be support of legal operators. What do I mean by this? I mean, well, in the context of research, we would use modern technology because it helps us to do research. Or contract generation. You have lots of programs today that generate legal documents for you, depending on certain variables that you will insert. Discovery, diligence. All these things today, in a large part, will be accomplished by computers and algorithms. Or access to justice. This is a big area where we employ algorithm and computer at the moment. Now, what we try to do is we, we try to create marketplaces where people meet and can exchange services. A good example is there are platforms, for example, how to find the lawyer for a case, marketplace. Another interesting example that um, you might have heard what is flight right. Now, most of you will know that there is a European directive that you get a certain amount for damages if your flight is delayed or canceled. Now, most of you will have never prosecuted this case because you get at a maximum 500, 600 euro. It's just not worth it going before a state court to collect this money. So what happens, there was a firm that is now the leader in the market, flight right, and they they have created an app, and within five minutes, if you fill out this app, they will take over the litigation for you, and within three weeks, you will get the money from this directive. As of this moment, of course, all the air companies are definitely scared and afraid, and it has revolu revolutionized the market. What I tend to say is here is, it facilitated access to justice. Before that, there was a claim, but nobody could, could claim yeah, or enforce the claim, now all of a sudden, barriers access to justice are removed and, and we can prosecute this case. And then, of course, finally, there is what I would call prediction. And now you will tell me, well, he talks about prediction, but hasn't he told us just before that it is impossible to simulate the decision of a judge? And here I, think, here I think you have to be aware of two things. There are two ways how you can predict the decision of a judge. One way is, of course, to simulate the decision. A second way of doing it is it with past data. I give you a couple of examples. Now, every one of you will have a spam filter. Yeah? And of course, every time you take an email and you put it in your spam filter, what will the machine learn from it? The machine will know, okay, if this email comes from some country, 
and the contents is, I'm the son of the late blah, blah, blah governor, and I have an offer that you can't decline because it's 50 million that I want to park on your account. So all these features, if you take them together, of course the prediction for the next email, whether you want to read it or whether you put it in the spam filter, is completely clear. If these elements are contained, then the prediction you don't want to read this email will be pretty accurate. Now this is an easy task, but there are things that are much more complicated. For example, when I started as a lawyer, one of the best paid people in the banks were those that did credit scoring. It was incredibly difficult to know in advance whether or not a debtor would default or not. Highly, highly paid. Today, if you go to a bank, these people have completely disappeared. They are no longer there. Why is that so? Because we work with algorithms, and the algorithms look more or less like this. You start with a certain scoring point, yeah, and then there are probably six, seven variables which lead to adding of points or subtracting of points. Now, for example, your employment status, the time you have spent in your current employment, loans, very interesting, the number of your credit cards. If you have no credit card, it's really bad. If you have too many credit cards, it's even worse. Yeah? So by adding and, and, and um, um, distracting the, um, uh, the scores, it will be at the end of the day. If your score is not over 700, you will never get the credit. Of course, this credit scoring is never going to be 100% accurate. It's accurate 80%, maybe 85%, but for the banks, it suffices completely to make their decisions, yeah? And, and to make it even more complicated, of course you can do it also for legal disputes with past data. And the starting point of all of that was a project in the US which was called the Supreme Court Forecasting Project. Now what they did at the time, the Supreme Court is a court that has about 80 to 90 cases per year. So it, it is a protected area. I mean, they're not doing like the Swiss federal courts, something like 4,000 decisions a year. They do 80 to 90 decisions a year. The advantage in the year 2002 was that the judges that were on the panel were there already for 10 years. So there was a lot of data on the individual judges because there had been no change. Now what they did in this project was as follows. They put together a prediction group and one of the groups was relying on experts. They had the best experts in the field, the best experts on employment law, the best experts on, I don't know, property law, what, whatever the Supreme Court decides. And the interesting thing is if you look on the homepage of the Supreme Court, every submission, every request that is filed is online. So, of course, all the material was accessible and the experts could make the prediction. And then they made a second group uh, prediction, and the second one was relying purely on past data. And the interesting thing was, this was data that was not legally related. So it was, for example, where did the case come from, which circuit? It was, for example, what, what is the field of law that we're discussing? What is the status of the respondent? What is the status of the claimant? So pretty easy variables to assess. And the interesting thing was that at the end of the day, the prediction based on the data was by 30% better than the prediction relying on experts. Yeah? Now, is that true or not? It is true, I can tell you. I, I'm involved in the Basketball Arbitral Tribunal, also a very protected area. They have probably 200 cases a year. Yeah? Simply structured cases, yeah? And if you look at the individual cases, I can tell you that with the same variables, I can give you a prediction of 70 or 80% of the outcome of the case. Much better than any expert could based on simulation of the decision. Now, what is typical about the environment that I was telling you is um, it is a protected environment. 80, 90 decisions a year, 200 decisions a year, this is not a significant number. But, but if you look at these protected areas, what you can say is that prediction based on data is faster, better, and much more consistent than prediction by experts. Now the question is, can you, can you use this mechanism and this system also for other environments, much more complex environments, environments where you have much more cases? And the interesting thing is, yes, you can. You can because 
there has been another project, a follow-up project, with the European Court of Human Rights. The European Court of Human Rights has several thousand decisions a year. Now you ask yourself, how on earth are they coping with this amount of data for trying to doing those predictions? And the reason is, well, if you have more data, your problem is you have to structure the data, or someone needs to structure the data, and then at the end of the day, of course, for every data, you have to give it a certain category, because if you don't give it a category, of course, you can't make predictions. Now, this is horribly complicated. How do you solve this problem? And from my perspective, there are two interesting developments that you need to keep in mind. The first one is what is called text mining. Text mining, there are a number of companies on the market that do that. Um, Lex NLP, Natural Language Processing, is only one of those companies. What they are able to do is, through algorithms, you can read a text and understand the text without a human being ever looking at a single line of the text. So what they're able to do actually is to find the most important variables in the text, and on top of that, they are able to classify decisions. They will be able to say, those decisions must be grouped together because they belong together, they are similar. And and to give you an example how, how efficient they are, I've, I've brought you a little video. It's a, a YouTube video, of course, so um, yeah, quality is uh, not super. And of course, it is from a company, um, Case Text. They want to sell something, so it's a little bit American. But at the end of the day, please have a look at it, what they're capable of doing, which I find quite, quite interesting. Can I ask you to um, switch on the video, please? Without further ado, uh, I have a case test up on the stage. But this is a very, uh, a very exciting demo for reasons why I'll let, I'll let the case test game is on. First of all, Christian, uh, big thanks to you and big thanks to Wolf and Foxy for uh, putting this together. My name is Alvin Dupagne. I'm the Vice President of Business Development at Case Test. And just a quick note before I go into what And 15 years ago. We've been able to earn the business of about 10, over 10% 10 of the AMLA 200, in addition to medium sized law firms and solos across the country. And today is really a special day for us at Case Tax. And the reason it's a special day is because for the first time publicly, we are showcasing our newly designed website with new features. And I'm so glad to do it right here. Woo! <laughs> Thank you for that, Christian. 
So this, as I, as I mentioned, this just came out. Uh, this is an article from Legal Tech News published about nine hours ago. Case Text announces AI search integration into revamp research tool. Uh, Do we be strategic? This is Gina Grady's blog. Said the, asked the question rather, did Case Text just drop kick keywords out of the legal research process? Maybe. Uh, Bob Ambrosi's website, also just from this morning. Case Text just made legal research a whole lot smarter. So at this point, and how much time do I have in the back? I think I'm, I'm missing my timekeeper back, back here. I've got five minutes, or he's just waving me high. Um, what I want to do at this point is build 0.1 hours together here with all of you in the room. And I want to show you how I'm going to do that. And I know that may be cringeworthy to a lot of you former litigators like me. You never thought you'd be billing time again, except for this 0.1. So what I want to do at this point, and, and this is another test of my technology skills, is zoom in, here we go, and show you what the new case text looks like. This is it right here. Now, I want to show you how this works by actually taking on a legal research problem. So I'm going to start with a brief, which is where oftentimes legal research starts. Let's see what happens when I open this up. OK, excellent. This is a brief filed by Quinn Emanuel in a case called Double Line Capital versus Odebrecht. Now imagine that you're working either with this brief or you're about to respond to the brief. This brief is fundamentally a shareholder action involving the diminution of the value of shares and the recourse that those shareholders have. Now the reason I'm using this particular brief is because it's pretty interesting. Because the theory of these shareholders in this particular case is that because there was a bribery scheme in Brazil where the defendant company is based, the shares crashed. And that is their theory of loss causation. When we bought shares in this company, we didn't expect that these executives in Brazil would be bribing the government. And we shouldn't have to suffer the loss in the value of our shares. So a couple key issues here, right? Loss causation, particularity, right? Now, let's say I wanted to conduct some legal research here. And I only had three minutes, as I just got waved there in the back. What I may do is simply put in the terms loss causation and particularity. Now, this is the moment that our engineer is back in. Oh, there we go. Look how fast that was. All right. I was going to say our engineer is back in the office uh, are, are wringing their hands over because, as you know, this just came out. But this is what we get here, right? Um, the case that we entered in involves a foreign company, involves loss causation, it involves a financial services company. Um, here's what we get. We get a national gaming company here, right? And if I click on that, I could go into, um, you know, the source of the loss of value in these particular shares, which was a press release about a potential uh, uh, acquisition being broken off, right? Well, so I could go back and look at the, the second case, right? This is a case, again, another domestic case involving uh, an earnings statement that came out that caused shares to drop. Again, pretty good, right? Loss causation, particularity, nice. Okay, but let me show you where the rubber really hits the road with case text featuring Kara AI technology. What I could do now is, as the backbone of my legal research, actually take the brief that I was working on, this Odebrecht case, or I should say Odebrecht brief, and drag and drop it into the interface right there. And now what you're going to see is where the magic happens. What you're about to see is uh, a level of relevance that simple Boolean searching cannot provide. So when we just saw cases that were domestic US cases involving press releases of affecting shares and involving earning statements affecting shares, here we see a case literally involving how a bribery scheme in Brazil affected the shares of a domestic US corporation. Let me go back and show you the next one. Can you stop? That's Okay. Seems like there's a fair amount of bribery in Brazil because the second one as well is a bribery scheme in Brazil. 
Now, what I want to show you is, is the following. In former times, if you wanted to do a search, you had to read the document first, detect the decision nodes, put them into your search tool, and then you may have found the relevant texts. What happens here is completely different. The whole brief is taken, dropped in the machine, the machine reads it, and finds out exactly the identical cases. How do they manage to do this? Only if they understand what the text is about. Yeah? This is actually quite interesting, and, and only with this kind of text mining, we're in a position to process, of course, this huge amount of data. We can apply today these kinds of predictions to any set of courts, and not just to protected environments with a couple of 50, 60, 100 decisions. Another development, which might be quite interesting on that, is machine learning on top of that. What, what does machine learning mean? Machine learning means that we try to artificially generate knowledge from experience. Here again, there are plenty of examples for that. Um, as I told you, the spam filter will get better every single time you drop one of your emails in the spam filter will exactly know what kinds of emails you would like to read in the future. The same thing is true for text messages. If you take out your mobile phone and you type in a text message, you always get proposals for the next word. Now, this is, of course, based exclusively on your individual use of text messages. Yeah? It gets better every single time you use it. The same, apparently, of course, I do not know, but apparently the same thing applies for dating platforms. So if, if you have expressed a preference for a certain type of persons, now the next persons that will be sent to you yeah, will, of course, match exactly these kinds of criteria. So at the end of the day, the interesting thing is that with past data, we're today capable of doing predictions which, uh, which are extraordinary, much better than experts could ever do, and on sets of data that experts could never manage. Okay. So my last point would be, well, how will this affect us? Because this is technology that is already on the market. How will it affect us? What, what is going to be the future for us in sports arbitration? Now, one thing is clear. I mean, we make our money with prediction. Yeah? If the client comes up to you and says, look, I have a case, what's going to happen? I mean, the first response as a lawyer that you will give is, Oh, this is a super complicated case. Why will you say so? Because if it's an easy case, you can't charge. Yeah? So of course you will say, super complicated case. I will look at it. It will take an awful lot of time, but we'll manage. Now, if prophecy would be certain, yeah, then of course the whole client-lawyer relationship is going to change in the future. A couple of other things from my perspective are changing too. And there are already quite a few companies on the market that are able to do such kind of forecast. Yeah? This is just one of the examples. I don't know whether it's true or not, but what, what they're telling you is that their prediction is to 86% accurate. That, that is amazing. That is absolutely staggering. Now, what could change? I mean, this is, this is a kind of digital disruption that we experience in our industry. Um, it is from causality, what I would call, to correlation. Of course, we have to understand that these kinds of predictions are rather dumb. It's a black box. What, what they're telling you is what the most likely outcome of a case is going to be. They're not going to give you any reasoning for that. Yeah, That's for sure. Yeah? So it's kind of a black box. And of course, we have huge issue with data protection on this one, which are not solved yet. But where can we use in the future these kinds of predictions? I think there are a couple of things that might be quite interesting. Of course, we can use it for risk analysis in litigation. Yeah? The client will love it. Yeah? Second thing is, it could be used for ratings. Now, of course, everybody of you knows that there are these journals around the who is who in legal and I don't know, whatever, and, and, and constantly you are overwhelmed with, with those emails whether or not you want to be in certain kinds of, of, of these who is who books. Yeah? But, I mean, what they're doing is hearsay. There's somebody who comes up and interviews you and says, is there a good lawyer? Yeah, I've heard of a good lawyer, and then, well, it's, it's going to be tracked down. What we can do in the future, of course, is we can make those ratings based on data. I can tell you, for example, at the Basketball Arbitral Tribunal, I can tell you exactly who outperforms the market. 
Exactly. I can predict the case and then look at the individual performance of every single lawyer acting before BAT, and I can tell you whether it outperforms the market or not. I can make a list which is really based on data, and something like this, I think, will be there for in the future. Not only for counsels, also for arbitrators. I think also that the client-attorney relationship will change. Now, imagine that these kinds of predictions would be available to a client. The client comes up to you and says, I have a good case for you. It's an 80 percenter, yeah, according to this, or in the range between 70 to 80 percent. Now, is this client willing to pay you 400, 500, 600 euros an hour? No. He's not going to do that. The only way he's going to do that is if you outperform the market. If this is a chance of winning of 20% and you win the case, then of course he will be willing to give you a, a, a big fee. Otherwise, things might be dramatically different, I think. What else? Insurance. Now, for the first time, if you have a rating for disputes, there could be a possibility to insure your risk. Because what is the insurance willing to know? I mean, they want to know what their risk is. And if ratings are there, it could be quite interesting that you get insurance for certain litigation disputes. What else could happen? I think that if you can rate the predictability of, of some of these litigation, those litigation will become a tradable asset. As you rate bonds, for example, with AAA or AAB, which has an influence, of course, on the tradability of those bonds, the same thing could happen, of course, for those kinds of litigation. It becomes a tradable asset, which would be interesting, for example, for athletes that cannot afford costly proceedings, they can sell it. Could be interesting for clubs, because clubs sometimes need the money quite quickly. They could trade their litigation disputes. And, and it could be interesting also for litigation funders. If you look at litigation funders at the moment, of course we know of them in the arbitration world. But they come in at very, very high level disputes. They come in at one million plus, absolute minimum. Now, if we are able in the future to, to predict based on past data, yeah, then this would open the market, the mass market for those uh, litigation funders, which could be an interesting alternative compared to legal aid, compared to other means of financing a dispute. Quality control. So. What, what I'm using in the context of the Basketball Arbitral Tribunal, for example, is the product at the Basketball Arbitral Tribunal heavily depends on the uniformity of jurisprudence. The user come to the bat and, and, and they're not keen on whether this arbitrator or the other arbitrator is going to decide the case because it's on a rotational basis. What is important for them is that the outcome is somehow predictable. It, it, it should be a constant jurisprudence. Now, what I can do with this tool is I can tell you whether one of the arbitrators for specific disputes is an outlier. I can tell whether, for example, one of the arbitrators has a disposition to be rather club friendly or rather employee friendly. Yeah, because I have all the data, I compare them, the, the arbitrators among themselves, and if I have a complete outlier, I can contact him and say, look, there seems something to be at odd. Why don't you look at your jurisprudence? Something seems to be wrong. So therefore, I think it could be also a very interesting tool for quality control. And finally, I think there could be an awful lot of new services around this digital disruption. So I don't think that we need to fear this development, but it could be a big opportunity for future events. Having said that, I think I come to my most important slide, which is thank you very much for your attention, and of course I'm here to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ulrich. Any question? Alguna pregunta? Maybe one comment, uh, or maybe a, a question also. I think uh, your analysis uh, is very interesting, but we should not undermine the work of the practicing uh, lawyers. If I see uh, the CAS, sometimes we have cases which are pretty clear at the outset. Even when I get the uh, statement of appeal, I could say, okay, it will go maybe more in that direction than the other. 
But when we see the procedure developing, and especially sometimes at the hearing, we can have surprises because of emotions, because of a witness who is losing totally uh, the, 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 the issue and his, uh, his mind is totally disturbed by the counter, uh, the cross-examination. So we may have also some surprises because of the work of the uh, attorneys and uh, also because an attorney has more arguments exploited than the other. Uh, so we may have some surprises which are not exactly according to the analysis. And I think it's also important to underline mm -hmm. the work of the, uh, of the lawyers. No, absolutely. What, what I'm not going to tell you because I, I don't want you to kill me. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to tell you that you can be substituted by an algorithm. Okay? What I try to tell you is that this could be a very interesting tool on top of that. And I'm absolutely with you. Of course, all the results that you get through these kinds of predictions, you have to interpret them. It would be a sheer stupidity from my point of view to take it as certainty, which from my perspective would be completely wrong. Yes, yeah? so you have to interpret it. If it says 80%, it does not mean that you get 80% of your claim. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a certain predictability for the outcome, but of course there are variables which, which do not fit. And I can tell you from, from my own testing with the Basketball Arbitral Tribunal, there are of course two types of cases where predictions are always wrong. The first type are the super easy cases. Yeah? Because then of course, looking at your back data on the average and on the profiling, you come to, to bad results. And the second type is the super, 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 super complicated cases. To give you an example, I don't know, in the 70s, for example, there was the case in Switzerland where the women should have a, a right to vote on a federal level, okay? Of course, if you look at back data, they were never allowed to vote before, yeah? So this was a rather complicated case. If you would look only back on back data, your prediction would have been super wrong. You would have said, never ever are, going to give, uh, are, are they going to get the voting right. So, of course, it doesn't fit all cases, but I think on on a good average of cases, it will help. And, and as I try to explain, for example, with the credit score, in a lot of circumstances for companies, it's completely enough to have a percentage of 80% because they can base their investment decision on these kind of things. It's not 100% right, but 80% in a lot of cases suffices. And I could imagine that there is a certain analogy also here that there might be quite a few services provided in the future where 80% is completely enough. Yeah, this, this is what I wanted to tell. So, absolutely sure, we can't replace the lawyer. Absolutely no. But, of course, we can evaluate his performance. Yes, we can do this, I think, on based on back data. Otra pregunta, al fondo. Por favor. Puede levantar la mano, por favor, para que le identifique. Gracias. Just, just a second. Are, are you saying it in, in Spanish or in English, the question? Spanish. Yeah, huh? Spanish. I yes, yes. I, I will ask school. my question in Spanish. I'm ready. Sí, profesor. Una, dos preguntas. Una es sobre el tema que no entendí bien, la cuestión de la ponderación, porque eh, bueno, entiendo su compatriota, ¿no? Robert Alexi, que ha sido uno de los más aleccionadores en este tema de la ponderación. ¿Se hace complicada la predicción cuando un juez pondera directamente basado en, en valores, principios y no solo efectivamente en un derecho positivo legal? Eh, eso quería saber su opinión, mi primera pregunta. Y segundo, saber si, ya que ha nombrado la, la Corte y también el tema de los derechos humanos, se ha conocido sobre el caso en el baloncesto de Nicolas Knapp en la Universidad de Northwestern, sobre una cuestión de discriminación resuelta por discriminación inversa. Ok. Ok, let me, let me start with the second question first. Yeah? So, what, what I've tried to tell you is what is possible. Yeah? What is practically possible, what, what I'm not going to tell you today, because of course we, we have only limited amount of time, is what legal prerequisites I would have to fulfill in order to put that into practice. I told you there is a huge thing with data protection yeah, when we talk about these things. And of course, all of data and all of this predictive analytics is full, is full of discrimination because what do we do? We do profiling. 
Yeah? You've seen this with the Supreme Court project. What they do is they profile, for example, the appellant. They profile the defendant. What type of person is that? Of course, that is discrimination. Yeah? And, and we need to ask ourselves, of course, how much discrimination are we going to allow in the future? Because all of that profiling is discrimination. 100% sure, 100% sure, yeah? Now, when it comes to waiting, I, I use the word waiting in the context of, from my perspective, there are three ways how you can predict. One is by intuition. That's the worst way of doing it. The second way would be doing it by what people call in economic or uh, uh, law of behavioral economics, they would call it slow thinking, yeah? Where pretty bad at quick thinking, but we're better at low think uh, slow thinking, and slow thinking means that you try to analyze problem by problem by problem, and then of course you weight the risk for the various decision odds. As I told you, I think this is a very legalistic approach. It is, it is my experience that of course there are plenty of other aspects that enter into a decision that are not covered by such a method, yeah? I've sit with plenty of arbitrators, and of course, yeah, um, you read a case first, you see the appellant, you see the respondent, you, you create a first impression. And, and there is always the risk that anything else that you read after that, yeah, that you read it selectively. Yeah? You have a first impression and you try to back your first impression. You, you read the stuff really selectively, and you need to pay attention to that. And it, it is my experience that every now and then, yeah, this doesn't happen. I mean, there are extraneous factors that enter into a decision, and, and this is proven. I mean, there are plenty of experiments. There are other experiments that, even, that are even more terrible. Yeah? For example, they had a couple of experiments with uh, criminal judges, and the uh, experiment was identical set of cases, identical, with breakfast, without breakfast. And the amazing thing was, if you don't give a judge a good breakfast, the sentence they're going to deliver is going to be significantly higher than with breakfast. Just to tell you, I mean, this does not mean that every single judge needs a breakfast to make a correct decision. No, absolutely no. But there is a risk of extraneous factors entering into the decision, absolutely. So therefore, I mean, keeping that in mind, of course, I mean, you should ask yourself, is it a wise decision, for example, to ask for an early start of a CAS hearing at eight o'clock? Hmm? I don't know. Is it a wise decision, for example, to say we skip lunch and we go through till three o'clock? I don't know. Yeah? If you ask every individual arbitrator, they will say, ah, oh, no, 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 it doesn't have anything to do with me. Um, I'm safe from these kinds of extraneous decisions. But on average, unfortunately, this is the case. And the anchor effect, also there, plenty of experiments. It's even worse than, as I said. For example, what they did with Harvard students is they gave them cases that they had to decide and they had a, a wheel. Yeah? They turned it and some numbers came up. And then they asked, it was of course manipulated. Yeah? So they had set certain sets of students that looked at the wheel yeah? and a certain number popped up and then they had to make a decision, also in criminal law, what kind of sentences they would give to uh, the criminal. And the interesting thing was, of course, what did the student say? Well, I'm not student, I'm, I'm a Harvard student. I'm not going to be influenced by these numbers that sporadically appear in front of me. But unfortunately, on average, it had a huge impact on what numbers came out at the end of the day. Yeah? So there is this element of anchor effect. I think we, we have to be conscious of that. Yeah? And, and these are factors that enter into a decision, 100% sure. Not every single case, but on average, unfortunately, yes, yeah, that's the case. Si no hay más preguntas, hacemos un pequeño descanso. Thank you, Ulrich. Thank you very much.